All right. So welcome back, everybody. We're so excited to have you with us. You know me, Melissa, down here with the beautiful dahlias in the back. I want everybody to um, to see that I got yesterday to share with you. Jim, wave your hand and, and remind everybody. <laughs> okay. So um, now we're going to go ahead and have you guys remind us of who you are. So whoever wants to give a shout out, go ahead. Remember to unmute your mic. Yeah. So unmute your mic and and say hello. Good morning, I'm Irina. Gina. Hello. Hi, Gina. <laughs> Sorry, we did it at the same time. This is Gina. Hi, Hi, Gina. This is Sarah Ann from Sustained Charlotte. And Hi. she's uh, not on the uh, not on the. Not we're having little video problems with her today. Anybody else want to share name and location? I'm Steve Bingham from San Rafael, uh, near San Francisco, and I seem to have lost everything, but I, I know it's here. So I right. We can hear you and we can see you. Jenny with San Francisco. Hi, Fennel from San Francisco and San Francisco Bay Area Families for Safe Streets. Allie, you want to just give a shout out since you're here today so everybody knows who you are? Hi, everyone. Thank you, Melissa, for um, offering to include me. I'm here to just sort of um, keep you company. Thank you. See what you're up to. Thank you. Amy, you want to give a shout out to everybody? Did you already shout out? Your mic is off, Amy. Okay. Amy, your mic is off. Can you say hello? You don't know how to remember. You just click on the mic at the top. You're having a problem with that. Okay. So Amy's having a little tech difficulty. All right. Amy, can you hear us? Okay. You hear it. You hear it. Okay. So Amy Morphis is in the center of mine with a blue t-shirt on, and she's here with us waving. And Jenny, you're here with us. You just waved. Okay. Me, sorry. Let's say that we're good to go, right, you guys? So we're here for about 90 minutes together. Everybody knows uh, about their mic and their, their camera. So keep yourselves muted when we're not having you speak so that we don't pick up your background noise. Um, so we really want to talk just very briefly about the goal of this session. And it's, first of all, to give you a few more tips to strengthen your storytelling skills to take them to the next level. Then we want you to learn about the process for identifying stories for your specific needs and audience. So now that you've gotten your story written, it might be that you need to be a talent scout to help find the stories of others. So you're going to be training your ear for that. And identifying, it's really important, whose stories to tell and how to tell them when and for why for your for your strategy. So we want to give you a little recap of asking you to bring your whole self to this. Turn off everything else if you can, please, and really focus in on this because yeah, it's hard, I know. <laughs> but this is you know 90 minutes for you, right? And and that's the gift to yourself. And we're asking you to stretch yourself. If you're someone again who tends to talk very, not very much and just observe please step forward and participate more. The opposite is true. If you're the alpha and you're used to talking a lot, maybe encourage somebody else to come forward and share a little bit more. Again, we want this to be a really safe, welcoming place for everybody to take themselves to the next level and create a space for each other. So the person speaking has the mic. Let's not talk over each other and not interrupt. Um, and that way we'll avoid cross-talking. And we know the lags and the everything within introductions is really, it's hard. Uh, and we're all learning new skill sets and we're learning to be much patient, more much more patient. We also wanna make sure that when it's time to give feedback about what somebody else shares, only share that information 
that's really helpful. This is not a critique session to tell people what they did wrong, okay? And then again, we know this group wouldn't do it. We know that, but let's keep everybody's confidentiality because people are sharing things that are really um, traumatic and heartbreaking. And in some cases, they might not be ready to step forward and be on a public platform yet. It, that is for the storyteller themselves to decide and not for the rest of the group, no matter how fabulous you think their story is and how ready it is to go, okay? So I wanna talk very briefly about taking your stories to another level of compelling. And when I told my own personal story last week, I told you that I was doing a couple things in it. I told a story about giving up my car and how at the very beginning of it, I was mortified with uh, embarrassment uh, because I was having to go to the impoundment yard to get my belongings out of it. And I was giving it up. And that I, because I dragged my feet, remember, I didn't get to get a tax break. I instead waited from embarrassment and then it got picked up for parking tickets I couldn't pay. So I started it as a very, a, a very embarrassed and very um, ashamed of myself. And at the end, I realized on the bus ride home. Uh, the air-conditioned bus ride in 95 degree heat that, hey, being able to read by, while traveling was going to be really great. It was that, by the way, giving up my car in 2007 that led me to be an active mobility advocate. So it, I didn't, if you had asked me in 2007, did you know your life in a few years is going to be transformed? I would have said, what? You know, what are you talking about? No, I'm a, I'm a PR person for entrepreneurs and uh, creative types. So that's something that we want you to think about. That aha moment, that that shift in your perspective about the way you thought about the world that happens because of this story that you're sharing and highlight it with people. It might be really obvious to you, but um, in one of the stories that were shared with us, the, the recognition was the streets aren't safe. I'm not, I'm not better. This is a really scary intersection and something needs to be done about it. So that's for a lot of you, it's going to be that shift that actually the step towards becoming an advocate. Zoom in on stories, especially these stories that are two or three minutes long for conversations, for blogs, for city council meetings. If it's a two year journey, a five year journey, take a snapshot and zoom in onto one portion of it as the part of the story that you share. And you can maybe gently touch on what happened. But if you want a two minute story that's really emotionally engaging, make sure that you you just like you would with a camera, right? Or a frame, you're gonna you're gonna cut off this the fluff, the extemporaneous extemporaneous fluff that you love to tell, but the other people are might not find so important, right? And then you might remember that I tuned in to two sense memories. And the two sense memories that I tuned into was the heat and the sound. So uh, the heat of me experiencing having a tough time with with heat and and how hot it was and then also that I I was dragging my suitcase, right, on wheels behind me clicking along on the sidewalk. So these are things that each one of you there's things that happened in these moments. And some of you shared a little bit about the ring of the phone or the knock on the door, but go into a few other things. How are you feeling in your body? What did you smell something? Did you taste something? That's the kind of thing that just really is going to put other people uh, into the story with you. And use active words. So if you've been in advocacy for a while now, some of you haven't, it's new for you. But if you've been in advocacy, you like to we like to use nicknames and jargon. Cut all of that out and assume that nobody has ever heard of your organization. They have no idea what you're talking about. So don't use any nicknames. And then any other jargon, uh, as Jim has talked about, how could you say that more simply? And I'm also going to say, how could you use more interesting, descriptive, active language? So easy to trip off the tongue when you're saying it, but interesting language choice when you're putting it all together. And now I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Thanks, Melissa. Um, I just I have a couple of, of points I wanted to reiterate after last week. Um, practice your story by writing it down and by reading it out loud. That is going to help you focus in on 
the compelling pieces of that story. You're going to train your ear to hear what is compelling. As you're telling that story, you're going to you're going to feel what works or doesn't work, what trips you up or doesn't trip you up. Um, when Melissa and I are teaching together and there's a lot of content that I'm delivering, I'll write it down and read it out loud to myself over and over and over and over, like dozens of times sometimes. And it just gets those words into my brain. It helps me figure out the fine details about phrasing. So do yourself a favor and, um, and give yourself that time. So really work on it as a, um, th think of a little bit about the performance aspect of the story. Um, to those of you who are concerned about how your story might be received, remember that your story exists within the context of your advocacy goals. Um, it doesn't have to do all the heavy lifting. So don't stress about whether uh, you've included um, all the details that absolutely need to be included. Focus really on what's what's true about your experience and what's true about the context of your story. Your story is going to live within the context of data, policy arguments. Um, so again, uh, you're not you're not carrying the whole weight of everything on your own shoulders. Um, your story is part of a strategy. So and I offer that as an encouragement. Um, and then finally, you want to think about telling your story the way you need to tell it. And this goes back to a point that I think you were making, Gina. Um, think about who is listening and why you're telling them your story. Um, that will determine what you say and how you say it. So I think Fennel brought this up last week. What you say in two minutes before the city council will be different from what you say in a 30-minute meeting with a public works director. So just, just kind of keep that in mind and what you want each of them to do. Your ask of a city council may be very different than your ask of a public works director. Um, so you're going you're gonna to think about how you tailor your story uh, to that situation. And that's what really brings us to kind of the heart of today's main exercise. Um, what we're going to be doing for the next uh, about 50 minutes is talking about the process for identifying the right story for the job. Um, there's a logic to how you find the right stories based on what you're trying to accomplish and whose hearts and minds you're trying to change. And, um, and so that was the, the purpose of the homework assignment was really to give you some prompts to start thinking about um, how your story fits into a strategy. Um, you might be somebody who's looking for other stories and this strategy is going to help you kind of frame that out. It was also, um, uh, you may be telling your own story. This, again, this is a strategy for focusing in on exactly um, what to say in what situation. Um, the homework covered kind of a four-step process. Uh, the first of it is define your advocacy goal. What's the concrete measurable thing that you want to accomplish? And you want to be as specific as possible with that because this is going to drive all your subsequent uh, choices. If your goal is I want to save the world, you've got a lot of choices. <laughs> if your goal is I want to get a crosswalk installed at the corner of 21st Street and 2nd Avenue, you have a, a much narrower range of things that you have to do. So, so always try to think in terms of the concrete measurable thing that you want to accomplish. And we'll get more into that as we talk about the homework. Um, the second step, once you've identified your goal, is to figure out your audience. Your audience is the person or the group whose main action is essential for accomplishing your goal. So again, if your goal is to install a crosswalk, who has the power to do that? It might be the public works director. It might be the transportation director. Um, you'll know best in your situation where you are in the process. Maybe it's the school principal um, at the inter who, who runs the school at the intersection where you want the, the crosswalk installed. But again, that person is your audience. Um, you want them to do something, and those are the people you want to think about as the audience for your story. Um, 
And now you can think about choosing your story. And this depends on what you know about the people who will benefit from your proposed change. So let's, you know, what you know about the people who will use the crosswalk, um, who your audience is and what motivates them um, uh, based on what you want them to do. And also who your audience listens to, uh, because you might have to be smart about who you put before your audience in order to get them to respond the way you need them to respond. Um, your own story might be absolutely perfect for this purpose, um, or someone else's story might be a better fit. So you really want to think about who you're trying to reach and why. And then the, um, uh, the last piece is now you're ready to think about your methods. Again, how you tell a story within a two-minute limit at a city council meeting is way different from how you tell a story in a face-to-face -face meeting with a, or, or even in a fundraising letter, for example. Um, typically, there are a bunch of ways you can tell a story and a bunch of places where you can tell it. The story that you absolutely need to tell at a city council meeting can also be told in a Twitter post um, on a, to a news reporter. Um, or in an e-newsletter. So you have a lot of options here. Um, so you want to keep those in mind. Um, quick sort of thumbs up, thumbs down. How did this um, homework exercise work for you? Did it, did it seem to make sense or was it difficult? Was it not easy? Just quick thumbs up, thumbs down. And, and no, no harm if it didn't, if it's a, if it's a neutral or a down. <laughs> Hopefully by the end of this, it'll all be up for you guys. Um, so what we're gonna do, a little bit, okay. What we're gonna do is go around the circle and share about a current or planned project or campaign and, in, and basically just kind of walk through the questions that we um, had you, uh, that we had you consider in the homework assignment. And I just realized I need to pull it up on my screen here. Um, here we go. Um, so, uh, and then Melissa and I'll just walk you through those questions to kind of troubleshoot how that went for you. Um, is there somebody who wants to go first? Gina, I saw your thumb go up before everybody else's. So can I put you on the spot and have you, uh, have you, have you be our first, uh, our first subject? Okay. <laughs> so, um, so let's start by the define your goal part of it. What's your specific? What's the specific problem you want to be? You want to solve, or the specific change you want to have made? Um, we want in families for safe streets to increase the number of advocates or people who have heard about it okay. to join us. We want more people to join us, and so. I think I know what your the answer to your next question is, but what's the specific action that is needed in order for you to accomplish that goal? Um, I'm not sure I know the answer to the next question, but um, outreach to um, groups who can help us or who have contact with crash victims. Does that make so, sense? Yeah, it does. So what action? I mean, it sounds like the action there is that you want you want your audience to respond, right? You want them to say, you want them to hear your story and say, yes, I want to be part of this. That's the oh, thing okay. you're trying to convince them to do. And again, my comments are all kind of in the service of that idea of saying it more uh, clearly and really drilling down to the, the actual thing that you're doing. I also want to point out here for everybody's benefit, this is basically a strategic planning process, right? You're starting out with, you have a very large mission. We want the world to be a better, safer, healthier place. And now we're going to get down to the goals that get us there. And those goals are measurable. They're actionable. Um, and, and I use this process in, in everything I do. What am I trying to accomplish? Who, did, who needs to be involved? What do we need them to do? And then how do we go about doing it? So this is a so so this is a the process that your organization would go through if it was developing a strategic plan. Um, and and again, I would argue that it's useful for for everybody. Um, and so 
So, so Gina, you said you want to increase the number of people who have uh, are aware of the stories of crash survivors and crash victims. Um, so, what are, who, what are the groups or communities that would benefit most by you being able to reach more people? Well, I think my goal though was more. Um, we need, we need. Oh, well, it's not stated very clear, but we need people like me or, or survivors to actually know about Families for Safe Streets. Okay. We need that kind of increase of awareness somehow. And so who's the, um, who's the end beneficiary of having more people who are participating? Everybody. <laughs> actually, because I say... Um, the people who will benefit is actually everyone who lives in this city. If we can get more advocates and make the street safer, then in the end, it's safer for everyone. That's kind of what I thought. And that seems broad, but I think that's appropriate, right? Like you're able to say, I would suggest you might even think about using a word like road user or neighborhood residents, um, really focus in on definable populations because those you're going to come back to that group a little further in this exercise. Um, so now let's talk about your audience. Who is the, like, so who is the key person whose action is essential for achieving this goal? So you want to have more people know, join your cause. So, so um, who are those people? Are they, are they mainly survivors or victims? Families? And um, yeah, exactly. All those things. So families of people who have died, um, we want them to know about this as okay. well. Um, so um, I don't know, because I, well, we're working, um, Allie, who just disappeared, and I <laughs> are working on something that I think she's working with Jenny on to, um, to talk with nurses and social workers at, at Zuckerberg SF General um, to make them aware of Families for Safe Streets so they can hand out resources and cards about the group to, um, they're in the um, traumatic brain injury unit. Um, and I used to work at a hospital that had a, a trauma center as well. And I'm already thinking of people that we could appeal to there. Cause I, I didn't, I could have received resources from them, but did not receive anything. So, um, so for audience, I don't know if you were asking for a specific, like this project who we're looking at. So if you're, if you're, if you're going to tell a story to somebody to inspire them to do something <clears throat> to join your cause or to help spread the word about your cause. Yeah. That's um, it that's how you want to be thinking about your audience and what is the action you want to take. And you've already named one of them, which is share information, right? If, it, if it's, a, if it's a, a physician or a nurse who's dealing with uh, a population of people who are uh, victims of crashes, for example, um, they can be a conduit. So just keep that in mind that you want to be able to pass, that you want them to be able to pass information along. Um, and that's kind of... Or, yes, or go do ahead. I, do you want to hold th um, comments or questions all to the end, or could I make a let's, comment? Let's hold them right to the end. I'm going to try to run through the rest of these questions, and then we'll kind of crowdsource some of the answers and see if anybody else has any suggestions. Um, what do you, and so you've talked about who your who the key person is. So, for example, it might be trauma nurses, and you've talked about what you want them to do, which is share information. Um, what groups so so are there any are there any groups or communities that you feel like your target audience can't afford to ignore and i'll just point out this this question is more useful when you're talking about political figures right political figures need to keep keep their eye on the landscape and there are people they might not relate to but that they have to keep an eye on so there, you may not have an answer here. I would say one thing you might consider for that question is people who don't speak English, 
people who aren't represented in their population, right? There could be a whole uh, kind of hidden population of people who aren't reporting crashes or don't immediately come to mind as being the victims of roadway violence. Um, and, and it would be valuable for your audience to be reminded that they're out there. So that's, you just want to kind oh. of, you want to keep your okay. eye on them because if you're going to ask them to help you do outreach, you want them to be kind of in your head about who should we be reaching out to. And there may be people that they don't think about as often as they could. Okay. You know, that's when a good I, idea. As a bike advocate, I started talking about the homeless, and that was really interesting because a lot of people were like, homeless people aren't bicyclists. And I said, that's how they get around. Like, yes, they are. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. And so, right. so think broadly there. Um, we'll kind of uh, go through the la next couple of these will be easy. So um, in talking to, say, trauma nurses about sharing the information, Whose stories best illustrate this problem? And that's kind of, I think that's that's sort of an obvious one here. Um, would it be crash victims and, and survivors? Is that whose story yeah, yes. best illustrate? Yes. And I'm a family of a victim. So yeah. I don't know. I think I'm a good fit. But I'm also a nurse. So <laughs> um, I I'm going to talk to my people. <laughs> I mean, I think that's really important to know. You may have this kind of secret special quality that gives you an end to a particular population that um, other people might not have. Steve might not be able to talk to that audience as well as you can because you know the culture of trauma nurses. It might be that you guys join forces and you take the healthcare community and Steve takes another community, right? So, so this is, this is in the service of thinking strategically. Um, and, and I think you've already answered this for us, but why would their particular stories be likeliest to touch your audience? So why would the stories of a family of a victim be, be the likeliest to touch that audience. I mean, you're a nurse, right? So you can speak to yeah. it from the nurse's perspective, the, the parent's perspective. Yeah, I, I was also thinking that um, as a nurse, you think these things will never happen to you. Um, and here this happened to me. And these are nurses who deal with trauma all the time. And um, I don't know, it, it, it makes it makes you just kind of stop and go, oh, yeah, I mean, this is there. This is this affects all of us. Um, and is maybe more, even more motivating for them to want to spread the word. And they care. I mean, this is a community that cares. The nurses and social workers really care about their patients. And um, and if they can give them information that will help them, I think that they would be excited about it, speaking so, as a nurse. So now we're going to talk about the methods for doing this. So you've talked about... Um, um, focusing on healthcare as one of those audiences. Um, so, when and where, when, where or when is it, will these stories be needed? And think very specifically about like when is the best time to reach them? Is it by email? Is it in person? Is it uh, a poster in a break room? Is it you know some sort of handout that's left someplace? Um, you're a nurse. Think about where, 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 and when would those stories be best heard? Yeah, well, if there wasn't a pandemic, <laughs> I would say an in-person in-service um, would have been ideal. With because as nurses, we had in-services all the time, and it's just something that you expect to do. And this would be part of the education, you know, day. They could bring in Allie and myself, and we'd talk to them about the organization. So I don't know, Allie's got to figure this out. Um, I guess we're doing Zoom or something. Um, but I, I like that idea of something up in the break room, like give them something to post in the break room as a reminder, because we, it, nurses have break rooms and the, the social workers use too. And there's usually always a bulletin board of, you know, just some, um, like a reminder, don't forget to, to, let patients know about this or yeah. So 
that kind of leads us to the last question, which is sort of when, what are all the ways that you could possibly tell this story, right? You've talked about a face-to-face -face meeting. We've talked about a poster. Are there other ways that a story about your experience could reach that audience? You know, it could be, uh, you know, it could be a website, right? You could have a web page and the link on the poster leads to the web page and there could be a bunch of stories people could read. Those stories could be videos. Those stories could be audio recordings. Um, uh, those stories could be a blurb in a newsletter that the local nurses association sends out or that the hospital sends out. Um, so again, you want to think about all of the all of the ways that that story can get out there. Um, um, so let's throw this open, and I think. I think that the next time we do this, I'll have each of you guys jump in as we do it, because I think saving questions to the end probably is a little clunky at this point. Um, any other suggestions for Gina or feedback about um, G the way that Gina's thinking about this? And go ahead and unmute and jump in as you want to. Steve, you had a you had a thought. Um, well, it just sits back when you were defining. Gina was defining the goal and um, <clears throat> the people to reach, and it occurred to me, and I know she believes this, but it didn't quite come out, that it came across a little as if the goal was to interest people in FSS to do advocacy work, but as we all know, one of the benefits of S FSS for all of us is what it does for us. That um. In terms of the healing process, being involved in advocacy around the issue that caused you to suffer is an important element in the healing process. And I was thinking particularly for people who you're outreaching to who are medical, medical. people, that would resonate perhaps more with some of them. Some of them might not be in advocacy particularly, but they're all into caring for mm -hmm. the people that they care for every day because that's what they do in life. <laughs> and so also kind of the stressing that um, FSS helps us and helps victims, helps families of victims helps survivors get through well you never get through it but mm -hmm. it helps on the journey so I, that was just my own yeah that, that's a great point that's my dog sorry <laughs> yeah that's a great point thank you and and to steve's point gina well and for steve too you might go through this set of questions for every single audience you want to reach Right. There may be a different way to reach every one of those audiences. Um, so this is not um, this is a good basic way to approach how to reach your audience and how to define your audience and therefore choose what stories to tell, how to tell them. Um, if and, and so the way you would answer these questions, if your audience was a city council are going to be different. But it may be the same set of stories. Uh, but again, you're going to do yourself the favor of drilling down and really understanding who's your audience, how does it serve your goal, that sort of thing. Um, any kind of closing comments, and then we'll take somebody else here. Melissa, yeah. Yeah, so putting my publicist hat on and knowing that we've got Allie on this, what I would say is that... Um, Actually, Gina, the fact that you're a nurse is phenomenal, that you are willing to tell this story and to get into exactly the right audience. If you guys had some kind of toolkit, PDF, a couple pages, digital download, something that could be printed and people could have easy access to, I would do media outreach to the actual um PR teams, the communications teams at the at all the hospitals, and then because you're such a media, still a, me, a rich media area, so I would actually go out to the news and the and the 
the different, you know, you could even have an online press conference and do a briefing to teach people about this phenomenal resource that mm-hmm. that's available. And I think mm-hmm. Steve's point of that this is about helping people heal was phenomenal. It just you've got yeah. such a you got some really fantastic synergy here, and I didn't want you to forget about doing media outreach. And and by the way, Melissa and I are available to uh, answer questions and troubleshoot offline. If you guys have an aha, you need to try out an idea or something, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, who else wants to go um, kind of walk through these questions with us? And Melissa's going to lead this next one, but who's, who's our next... Uh, Who's our next uh, subject here? Who wants to go? Maybe somebody who had a good experience with the homework. <laughs> I didn't have a bad experience. I just had a hard time, but I did write good. what I on whatever questions I could answer, so I could share that to get help. Okay. All right. So let's make sure. Let's so let's get you from a neutral to moving in the right direction, so that you feel empowered about how to use this. How's that? Yes, that's the whole point why we're here. Exactly. So we want to go uh, to the the first question. And what is the specific problem you want to solve or the change you want to make? Let's just start at the very beginning. So I wrote reducing speed on high traffic streets. That's what I put. And I don't know if it's specific enough. Um, I, um, I think that that's fantastic. What I would recommend is um, if you have a, a, a few very specific streets that you know those are the c- crash corridors um, that you've got the statistics on and that you have a, do you have a story of that street? Um, I'm sure there's a list of streets that Walk us up has told us, but the right. street that comes to mind that I focus on or have done work around is Park Presidio in the Bay Area because that's where my mom's crash happened. Exactly. That, yeah. That's exactly what that's. So you've, you've nailed it. Okay. So, um, and what is it? So let's get a little, let's drill down to, into a little more specifics. Have you guys decided as a strategy, how much you want the speeds to be reduced on a certain number of streets? So what I'm looking for is a measurable goal that you'll know that you you're working towards your right, um, like for example, are these streets that over the past, you know, I'm a Calif- I'm a Californian, so I know we've got that crazy deal where the streets just keep getting faster and faster. So are these streets that have just gotten faster and faster over like let's say the last 20, 30 years, and now you want to redu- get their speeds reduced back to what the streets originally had? So something that's measurable, like you you can uh, like especially if you have to go to different council districts to and different things to get the speed's reduced, you can say, hey, we got it in here. If we got it over here, we're going to be able to get it over here. Or you might be dealing with different council members. Does that make sense? Yes. So there is that, I guess, at targeted speed that we, I know in past campaigns I'm part of. It's in my notes somewhere. I don't have it memorized. <laughs> but oh, no, I, no, that's fine, but I just want to know that. You, so you've got very yeah. specific measurable goals in mind. Yes. Well, so that's that- has provided us with like what we should be asking for in terms of the reduction. Yes. Fantastic. And so what do you think the specific action is needed in order to solve this problem or to make the needed change? So for instance, the Park Presidio street that I mentioned is a state street. It's not a city street. So there's a two-step layer um, to reduce it. So what I put down in it to as the first thought was work with state and city leaders to just reduce that speed down. Um, so that's all I put. And I, that's why it was not a bad homework. It was just a difficult homework in terms of how to answer it. Right. So, and so, I was just going to add, Jenny, I think that's specific enough for purposes of guiding you to the stories that will help you illustrate the need for solving the problem. That's okay. the kind of that's the process here is to is to is to point you towards the stories that will help you make the case for reduced speeds on Park Presidio. And I'm very familiar with Park Presidio, so good. <laughs> That's a good goal. So what groups or communities would benefit most from this solution or change, right? I put pedestrians in the in the in the neighboring community or the neighborhood. 
because there's a lot of walking. Right. Uh, and, and how about like, are there schools along this that um, that would benefit from this? Not near that main street, but because it is a populated neighborhood, there are it is a major street that they uh, families or communities walk through to get to church or get to get to the different school areas. So you have really good um, audiences and possible collaborators then in the schools and the churches there, right? That you can do outreach to get this story. But let's go back to, um, okay, so now we want to go down into deeper and it's like, who's the key person or group whose action is essential for this goal? And you talked about uh, the, the people in the, the city and the state. Do you know exactly whose offices those are, what their titles are? You guys are clear on who, who you want to be connected with? Yes, but I I remember them as state leaders and depart people in Department of Transportation. Okay, all right. I would. There's probably more specific roles that I have been told, um, but I don't know exactly what those roles are. So I think that's a good place to 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 make a note that you want to ask some questions, like where does the decision about traffic speeds on Park Presidio get made? Do they get made at in Sacramento? Do they get made at Caltrans District 4? Um, and possibly who in the uh, city and county of San Francisco is responsible for some of those decision making? So that's another kind of a line of inquiry for you. Those are all good possible audiences to be thinking about. Right. And to, I mean, Jim has a lot more expertise in this area of those specific regions, but it also timelines, right? Like timelines of when they make these kind of decisions. Um, often they only meet at certain times or they only get together at certain times and, or, or the laws are only passed at certain times. So you want to make sure that you're as part of your storytelling strategy that you're putting together, that it's going to sync up with, whereas Gina doesn't have those same restrictions about getting Hers is evergreen, and yours is going to be a little bit, a um, little bit more uh, strategic as far as like timelines and and when you want to make things like that happen. And you know, you know what you want your audience to do, right? Um, you want them to lower the speeds, and you you know exactly the streets, and you know exactly by how much. I. So I I would also add, Jenny, that that you what you want them to do is listen to you. <laughs> you want them to agree with your perspective. It's one thing to have a meeting and have them say, nope, can't do anything. <laughs> so think in terms of what you want. What's your ideal thing for them to do? Because that's also going to help you find the compelling stories that will make them responsive to your ask. And and to the and to the next and when we go deeper in this, the next step is who do they listen to? So are these people influenced by the city council people? And Fennel has a has something. You've got a mic. Put your mic on, Fennel, so we can hear you. Yeah. Um. To that question, this kind of came up before is um, the uncertainty of how to address these audiences and what they what influences them to change their mind and hearts. Um, you know, I'm finding that there's economic factors that, you know, um, are taking precedence in our case over the, over safety, right? And so how do those priorities, you know, what does that dialogue look like, I guess, because I feel like there's economic factors. And if that's their measure that they're listening to, so then do we have to frame our story in economic? Um, yes. Okay. So, yes. Yeah, so this is actually one that I know a little bit about. Political will. So I feel like yeah. this, it's, it's illogical as we can probably agree, um, you know, for many, 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 many reasons um, to willfully ignore our stories and our case for making a more inclusive design. Right. Okay. So, so here you've got something that syncs up here. Okay? okay. So what you're dealing with is a street that they made faster and faster. And we have a fallacy in this country that um, commuters are number one. And so they've destroyed business on certain in certain areas because people can no longer remember to stop fast enough to do their shopping on these streets, right? So speed actually kills, speed actually kills 
the business on these thoroughfares. And the business owners likely do not know that. Okay, so you've got a you've got one of the cities that that uh, took, let's say, for example, um, now everybody's eating outside, right? And everybody's trying to make parklets. Well, you've it, San Francisco is the city that in the United States began the parklet. Uh, we took it in Long Beach and ran with it from from uh, San Francisco. So those kind of, this kind of streets and the speed that you need to have outside dining is exactly lines up with what you guys want to do. So if you want really thriving economic corridors, you need to bring this, the speeds way down. And so the business districts should be your number one allies in this. And, and um, sorry, Jenny, that I, we kind of went off on this, but they should be your partner. Yeah. Right. I would not if you aren't already. And I would also add, Fennel, learn about the decision makers. Like get to know them, ask around about the intel. You don't know who's gone to school with who. You don't know. It's quite possible that you have a decision maker who who uh, has a family member who's been hit or killed in a crash, right? And so there's a lot of value in really focusing on knowing who you're dealing with because that's going to tell you what they that's going to start to tell you what they respond to if you um yeah if you know where they went to school if you know who they you know where they live if you know you start to know more about them you're going to you're going to understand their personality a little bit better um and okay. go ahead. See for short comment, uh, and I hope because we're all in FSS together, we can focus on this in our work. But the speed thing in part of the city was the exhibit A is a perfect example of why a crazy rule that we all have heard about, it's called the 85th percentile rule. Right, that's what I was referring to. Uh, is absolute nonsense, and it's very exciting that all over the country states are getting rid of it, and NACTO just recently came out with a report saying that it's nonsense. And Melissa, when you keep saying people go faster and faster, one of the reasons is that because of the 85th percentile rule, they keep upping the speed. I know that very well. That's Yeah, uh, Steve, that's exactly what I was referring to. Yeah, and we, we, had a, we had a street here in San Rafael that a lot of bikes use. They recently raised the speed limit because they said they had to under the law. Right. And that's obviously not the goal necessarily of the campaign that Jenny is. Right. And you know, you know, a campaign. Right. In its and early stages can define different goals um, and so it doesn't get too complicated or off track. You can kind of have this chart that you have different charts for each of several goals that ultimately the goal is to reduce speed limit in Park Presidio, but they have um, sort of pieces to them that because that would require the state legislature getting involved, and that's different than getting Caltrans to reassess um, what's going on in the Park Presidio. Right, so two things on that that I want to talk about is, again, going back to the media, because when you, when you want to really influence people, the media is one of the best places, even if it's not a, you can have papers that are not hugely read, but they're read by the influencers, right? They're read by the exact audience. Jim and I were talking about this yesterday. They're read by the very people. So it might be an op-ed um, or it might be an article about specifically this. Like th they should be in all of your, your papers. And recently, there's so there's a new um, uh, African-American-led um, urban planning firm that just launched out of Oakland. And the young woman, I'm not remembering her name, Dr. I think I want to say Dr. Jennifer, and I can't remember her last name. But anyways, she was on ABC Channel 7 taking the reporter on a tour of the streets. I have never in 
my almost 15 years of being involved in this, seen urban planning and um, addressing street speed and speed bumps on on network news. And I thought, well, this is fantastic because the reporter was really interested. So in the time of COVID, they might be really hungry for this kind of story. And Jim, you probably know more about this and Allie than I do, but isn't Laura Friedman, the former uh, mayor of Pasadena, yeah. the representative that's working on the law? And she yeah, I, I want to do a quick time check. Um, okay. It's close to noon, and I want to make sure that we get through the questions um, the questions about on this worksheet for Jenny's benefit. The other point that I'll make is that remember, we're talking about the storytelling component of a strategy to get potentially get the law changed. So there are, of course, laws, there are statutes that might need to be repealed. Think about the stories, the human personal stories that can be told in service of making that argument. So there's the there's the technical law change that you want to make, and then there's the story that gets people, legislators and decision makers, uh, motivated to do that. So Jenny, you have a story that's front and center to this, right? Your story is our key. And then think about the different audiences in the sense of age groups, right? That of people that do are the, is there a, are there small ch somebody who lost a small child or somebody who was gravely injured because of this and just kind of go through you know your different when you're thinking about okay we're going to put these stories we're going to drop these stories into our email newsletters our different outreach our public uh, when we go to churches and different organizations how do we like sprinkle these little short stories in that kind of do a 360 degree cover of whose heart could be opened and they could go, wow, that's me. That's my family. That was my mom. That was my grandmother. That was my child. That was my husband. You know, so, and I'm sure you guys have those stories, right? And Fennel has a, has a comment. Can you talk about um, the efficacy of using honey in your story, being really sweet about your story or you know, carrot, what versus stick, right? And, um, you know, cause on one side I wanna call them all mofos and, you know, I've been convinced otherwise to be like, no, no, don't do that. You know, um, but to your point exactly what you were saying, Melissa, is I do wanna put them in our shoes. And I literally have said like, how would you like it if your grandchild's face was in the, the face of a grill of a car in there for about 20 minutes, you know? so telling the story, the narrative from their standpoint, or how about if I give you a call in the afternoon, I'm sorry to regret, um, to report to you that you're, because I know that some of them have children, you know, so I feel like it is a form of like hypocrisy. It's like, well, it doesn't apply to me, but you know, we're imposing these situations on you. Well, yeah. I would, what I would add to that is just that um, this goes back to the question of knowing who your audience is and what you want them to do. Um, and 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 you may personally feel very angry about the lack of action and the and the path forward might be to get them on your side. And mm -hmm. so then it's a question of, of kind of finding either uh, the right story or the right tone um, mm -hmm. or the right method to get them on your side, because the political mm -hmm. reality is that. Um, the person who refuses to listen to you is probably not going to hear what you have to say, right? Um, and so, so it's a personal dance to kind of figure out how you, how you, uh, how you get your yourselves on the same page. It, it, it'll take some thinking, and that's really. Okay, so I need to jump in here on that one, Jim. Um, right. So, on that, it is a tough dance. Okay, but think about this and the aha moment, right? So we had Gina talk about nurses never think it's gonna happen to them, right? That's a lot of us. Some of us are people who think every bad thing is gonna happen every time we walk out the door. Mm -hmm. And some of us think nothing is ever gonna happen to us. And so if, you've, if you're a person like Gina, you, uh, excuse me, Fennel, you ride a motorcycle, you like speed, right? So yeah, I, I would say what I'm learning is you get more bees with honey in the sense that 
it's not that your anger isn't righteous and it doesn't have a place, but sometimes when you're first getting to know these people, it's kind of like you say, yeah, you know, I, I thought I was safe. I thought I was, you know, imagine if, and there's a way to say some of the really, you said some really like engaging, like imagine if this was your child, but you can say it with your, the energy of touching their heart rather than I am so angry at all these drivers for being so dismissive. So we know we have a speed freak culture, right? We have people that are obsessed with going faster and faster. They don't even realize it. People that are probably the most responsible mothers and parents and whatever are texting while driving. Everybody thinks they can handle it. So we almost have to use humor and, hey, I never thought this would happen to me. And all of a sudden, are people they're like, wow, I have a Kajiva Ducati too. Uh, wow, are we like, I can't remember, like I, you know, the, the way the way people find ways to um, align with others is fascinating. So I do think you have to use a little. You have to use sugar more than you want to use, um, you know, pounding, unless you know that it's an audience where most of the people are already on your side, and it's a place where you can do more of the preach to the choir, right? So it's 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 yeah, Jenny. I will say with Mike, so like, let me answer the question and I'll share what my thought process and kind of answer fennel. So I did put family members of victims, survivors, and anyone that can share stats on speeding. Those are the, you know, the stories that we would be using in the different pockets. Um, and then I said, and then it's asked you whose stories are likeliest to test your audience. Um, I put vic surviving victims more so than even family members representing victims, because I think that when there's a real human being that has experienced a crash that impacted them, they're still living, but sh really sharing what they're going through day to day tends to relate to people more because when there's like a death, you know, don't get me wrong, people feel sorry, but it's like, it kind of gets swept to the past, right? Like, you know, like the person's already gone. So real everyday impact is where I think most human beings um, can resonate better. But I was going to lead to with my different times in sharing my story, regardless of it, whether it was a community event or getting a bill passed, I think there is a difference in, at least with my experience, where using funnels, where is it honey or what not honey? I think when it comes to the political leaders and businesses that have an economic interest, I do tend to focus more on the anger where like you have a responsibility because you are you were voted in to protect the community, you know, whatever community you stand for. And then as business owners, you know, it's talking about the bottom line, like, like you know, if you don't participate in this, your economic revenue is going to go down. So I think that that is where some of that anger or some of that non honey can come from. But in general, like my other experiences, normal people, if they hear a tragedy, living or not living, they think the tragedy is not going to happen to them. Most people are just like that, like they hear it. And they feel very sorry the moment the minute of it when they're hearing it, and they catch it on media. But the next day they go back to like, okay, this is really not going to happen to me. Right. And that's just what my experience has been with the different levels of tragedy my family has gone through and, and even talking to like my friends and family members. So I think that anytime you can put some more normalcy and kind of put them in a space where, you know, it's you're not making them feel sorry for you or making them feel like bad for you, but it's more like this kind of happened. Like my mom was just taking a walk like she normally does and she's the safest person and you know, this happened. I think people can put themselves in that shoe more because people tend to think that they're immortal and that tragedies are not gonna happen to them and tragedies only happen to like very, very few people. But in reality, our traffic violence stats is saying it's happening more often than they think. And then they tend to turn a blind eye when it's something that they think is so not gonna happen or so tra tragic. So I have found when I talk in like our World Remembrance Day, I had to adjust my story, same story, but different times because my biggest goal is to get normal people, meaning everyday people to say, if we all do our part, this is gonna be so much easier. And that's a really hard message to be heard for people to take and change their action. And I have found with my experience, I have gotten more results when I just normalize it. You know, like when I changed my speech, even this last year, where it was just going through the normal day of what this has done. You know, I think people can think and relate to that versus, oh, if there's a tragedy, right? Like, oh, this tragedy is not going to happen to me. Yeah, because well, if you really think about it, your network, there's not every single person in your network has a tragedy that happens to them. It's when you bring in the whole community and society numbers, that numbers go up. But if you really look at your friends and family, 
you know, and people you interact with, you don't really hear that. So there's that level of denial that people don't even acknowledge that's what they're doing subconsciously. So that's yep. my experience. So I think that would be how I would answer you, Fennel, uh, because it is very frustrating. Um, but I have learned political leaders, businesses that have economic interest in the media, the the they like the the, the 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 nastier type of stories, right? And you know, the anger there comes because that's what they, what they want to push away. But normal people, like it, they hear it and then it's like, okay, you know, it's just her. Let me just feel sorry for her right now, but I'm not gonna really do anything. So, could I make just a quick comment to Jenny? Because um, I think it's a perfect example of the specific going to the general and also the relationship of individual stories to statistics. One thing that all of us know about Park Presidio is that these crashes have been going on for years. And the particular outrage, um, almost more than the individual incident that happens, is that the city has known of these crashes that not only hurt people but kill people for years and they won't reduce the speed limit. So it seems to me that one thing that needs to be blended into individual stories is, uh, and particularly as a way to reach the people who say, oh, well, they don't happen uh, uh, very much and so forth, is to say, well, and you know what? My mom is the 13th person in the last five years to get hit on Park Presidio and the city doesn't do anything about it. And all of a sudden, I think, that helps focus people's attention. Holy camoli, yeah, Park Presidio really is a more dangerous place than I thought. I didn't know there were that many people who've been uh, hit. Jenny, I want to touch on um, your the normalcy thing because I think you actually have something very, you're really close to something that's very powerful on that. And that is that we're, we're, in a, we're a culture that is obsessed with going, moving fast in all kinds of things. You guys are probably already doing this, but the other, the other, you know, depending on how, when they reduce the speeds, depending on how they sync up the lights and stuff, peak traffic actually flows through. Like we think the faster we go, the faster we go, the faster. And I know in Long Beach, right? So the thing is that it's, you can be on their side that they want to get places in a hurry, but it's like, really, is that, is that three minutes? That three minutes that you think you're going to save, which you actually don't save, is that worth your life? Is that worth somebody else's life? And there's a way of using humor to kind of get people to look at themselves, to look in the mirror and, um, and recognize that we all play a role in this. So, you know, that's, and, and it's and it's really we need to create a culture shift around it. And uh, I loved seeing your fire about this because I think you're really close to really understanding completely who the audience is that you really want to affect. I wanted, I wanted to add one thing, and then I feel like we ought to move on to one more person if we can do it, and then also do a little time check. Um, Fennel and Jenny, one thing to think about is the value of the good cop and the bad cop. So, Fennel, you might be the you might be the perfect angry voice, and Jenny I, you might be the perfectly reasonable voice, right? So, there's multiple stories that illustrate the problem, and um, this is where having a strategy, going through these questions, really knowing um, uh, who you're talking to. What do they respond to? And once you can really nail those things down, then you can start figuring out um, um, who meets with the decision makers. Um, you know, maybe Fennel, you're off on the side being loud and bold and angry, and Jenny is the one in the meetings, and you're you're kind of uh, keeping the audience stirred up, right? So, like, mm -hmm. that's a you know, think about that value. I struggled with that in bike advocacy when, you know, some crazy person would go off on social media about banning all the cars or, you know, 
And, and I, and at first I thought that's crazy. And then I thought, no, no, it's actually helpful for this person to be adding this idea. I can come in and seem reasonable. Somebody who absolutely is going to ignore the crazy person might listen to me. So there's some, there's some theater to this that you want to think through. And I think you're going to get, you're going to start to recognize that opportunity as you go through these questions. You might even want to sit down collectively and go through these questions together to figure out exactly whose stories are the most compelling, who tells them, um, um, how are they told, and again, where are they told? You know, is it is it a website? I mean, Fennel, you might be the perfect person to do a video of you walking down the street talking about, look at that intersection. That's crazy, right? Like that that could be the perfect vehicle to capture your fire. And and somebody, you know, Jenny, it might be you or somebody else might be best suited to sit down and have a calm conversation with the decision maker, right? Both are necessary and both are true and valid. And really the point here is to be strategic about how you, um, how you approach that. Um, I want to just check in. It's 13 after we're scheduled to end at, ha uh, at the half hour. Um, are you guys okay with going a little bit longer? If we can, if we can go through this, um, it looks like a little bit. Okay, let's see if, does 10 minutes sound like okay? Like if we went 10 minutes over, would that work for people? Um, let's see if we can, if there's one other person who wants to share and we can kind of walk through these questions. I'll walk you through them kind of, kind of briskly. Um, Amy, did you want to, did you want to take a, take a crack at this? No? <laughs> okay. You know what? I did want to ask Sarah because she's coming at it from a very different angle yeah from, Sarah so if you're with us did you I mean you're still with us but we don't have you on mic if you wanted to go through some of the things you guys have been working on yeah let's walk let's walk through these questions Sarah are you are you up for that I need you to, um, there we go. yeah I, I actually don't don't have a specific problem in mind um okay. so I I I'm, we want to use that time for somebody else um I'm, I'm happy to just listen along Okay. Um, anybody else? Fennel. Okay. I can go ahead. Um, and thanks for all this. Um, as you were talking, I was just reminded of how in our campaign, um, we want to have a single, safe, equitable, sustainable pathway from the historic Fillmore to the legendary Ocean Beach in San Francisco via a car-free pathway in Golden Gate Park. Um, and one of the, surprisingly, you know, we were out there goofing along, um, this is just a side note, and the storytelling, I was like, oh yeah, okay, we have herons, and we have hawks, and we have bison, we have a lot of wildlife that's in the park. And so what we ended up doing as a chalk project was understanding what those foot tracks look like, and then put those on the roadway, because they are doing a little sample project, and actually, that's really kind of, you know, delighted folks to be like, oh, yeah, you know, Heron live here. It's not just a people thing. And, um, you know, that's obviously part of the reason why people go to the park is for that bonding with nature. Um, so I did get through some of the questions that you had. Um, what did you have for defining your goal? What were your answers in those first three questions? Defining the goal would be get the city of San Francisco as park and rec. Who uh, regulates the roadways in Golden Gate Park? Um, so it's not SFMTA. Um, okay. Yep. So and trying to um, and make a clear continuous pathway all the way to the beach from the Fillmore. So the Fillmore Street um, is in District Five. Can um, I ask what what specifically would need to be done in order to get that continuous path? Do you need a plan? Do you need money? Do you need to deal with an intersection? What's the specific thing that would make that a continuous path? Um, and Ali can jump in here. And this is, I would say we would need to get approval for funding to convert existing roadways, which are car centric designs clogged by thousands of parking park cars and fast moving cars into a path that's more inclusive for all road users. So you have a specific idea of a, like a design concept you know, reduce the volume of traffic on a particular route so that you can accommodate everybody else. Yeah. And there's a lot of different ways that they could compromise this because there isn't one single path yet that is free of cars to get you from 
the edge of Golden Gate Park on the Haight Street side um, yeah. to the beach side. Um, so I would imagine that it would be Park and Rec during their meetings um, and their board of commissioners to determine whether or not they want to prove the um, modification of their existing roadways to accommodate this need. So it sounds like maybe the adoption of a plan. And again, I think it's valuable to zero in on what specifically you want people to do, because that starts to dictate things like timelines, like, is there a plan? How long does it take to come up with a plan? Mm -hmm. um, what does it cost to come up with a plan? What does it cost to implement it? You might not have all those answers. Parks and Rec would. But, um, but that starts to kind of help you line up your storytelling opportunities because the stories that you tell to the park and rec commission might be different than the stories you tell to the neighborhoods that you want to get on board right so there's so again knowing what your specific goal is is going to start to point you to who needs to hear your stories and then sort of what stories are the ones that are going to move the needle um, and so let's talk about your audience. Um, you mentioned that a, a key group whose action is needed is Park and Rec. Is that the department? Is there a commission? Is there a director who needs to be convinced? Yes, yes, yes. And we don't need to pick that one yet, but you might think about if – if you're coming up with this concept of a plan that would implement a continuous path, where would you start? Like, who's the first person you would start with? It might be uh, the most friendly park and rec commissioner, right? Like, you might have a connection with a park and rec commissioner. You plant the seed with that person and say, we need you to be a champion. Help us get to your director, right? So think about what your path forward is, because the path forward is going to tell you what stories you want to have lined up to get each of those actors to respond the way that you need them to respond. And um, you, you also might have a fennel, a, uh, an economic one on this as well, because sure. that path could be quite a tourism attraction, right? Sure. So it happens a lot. Yeah. So if there's like a business improvement district in that area that would highly benefit from having that increased traffic, they might be uh, they might surprisingly actually be able to raise the funds to get the plan done uh, if they're a, a well organized group. And, and I think the point here is to be thinking specifically about who whose action is absolutely essential. Right. Like their action is absolutely essential to this. Um, you might find that there is a supervisor whose thing is park and rec. Right. Whose thing is Golden Gate Park, whose yeah. thing is riding their bike to the ocean. Right. I've ridden that path. I know that route you're talking about. That would be fantastic. I love riding there. And so um, so again, when you're thinking about audiences, think about sort of who you absolutely need to have on your side, because that's going to guide you to the stories that are going to change their hearts and minds. And you can't pick those stories without knowing who you want to touch. Right. You can't you know, you, you probably have a hunch, but now you're going to really line this up into a storytelling strategy. Um, so let's talk about. Um, stories, whose stories best illustrate the need for this uh, the need for this improvement? So um, my story is that this park is our home because we live in a small little apartment and with a young brown child um, and being a historically black neighborhood, I especially want to make sure that the kids during this time and moving forward and for future generations also consider the park and the beach their home and get familiar with it and um, feel safe going there, you know, and statistics, statistics, statistic, um, can support that this is an underserved community, right? Um, our district supervisor is very supportive, so I'm happy about that. The SFMT director is very supportive, so I'm happy about that. But then it becomes this limited resources priority shift type of thing, it seems like. Um, so what I have done to date is, as I'm trying to brainstorm these solutions and also kind of think of things for him to focus on and to be able to represent himself, is to have him, my son, on the calls 
So it's coming from his voice. Also, I've done a lot of videos when he was really young. And what you're going to see in all those video footage is, um, you know, images of young children playing in beautiful natural settings and then overlaying it with, you know, if we were to form a nonprofit or some sort of splinter like that, the D5 weather reporters really, really kind of understand the climate, you know, from an urban perspective, you know, we live in between all these intersections. Um, so the need to have the renewed interest in having access to green space, um, to get energized, to feel free, um, to also um, realize that this is our home um, and we coexist, um, to feel healthy, safe, and happy, um, that this is a really important factor that we, um, and that it is um, something that's not available today. Well, so it sounds like you have started to think about who the beneficiaries are. Because remember that, you know, if you go back up to the top of that worksheet, um, the question is what groups or communities would benefit most from this solution or change? That group is almost always the group whose stories are the likeliest to touch your audience, right? And the stories that best illustrate. So, so there's a connection between those two things. And that's the value of going through this exercise is you, you, you want to always think about pulling from the stories of the beneficiaries of the needed change or the solution that you're going after. Um, uh, a couple of things about meth. Did you have a question? Over, please. Um, and so some of this, you know, and I know that, um, you know, Vision Zero Network here and Walk SF and, um, you know, San Francisco Bike Coalition, they're doing fantastic work and they also, you know, have limited capacity. So I wanted to find a niche because as I was listening to these stories, they were very, and knowing that director at this park and rec, he's like, I don't want to hear from Walk SF anymore. I don't want to hear from the Bike Coalition. Who else wants this space? So we've also connected with the roller skaters here. And I found that, like, especially the kids, they don't care what they're on and, you know, your active mobility phrase. I had never heard that before, but they just want to roll, right? They want to go and that need for speed, but it's also like a very innocent and something that's really near and dear to my heart is really getting moving and that that has been such like a glorious part of, you know, my daily life and a normal part of my life. And I know that not everyone else is like an endurance athlete, but that's really, um, it's been so fantastic for me. And so when I see young kids, you know, and that whole argument with if you make the streets safe for kids then everyone else benefits. Right. So I kind of feel like that should be the benchmark. Sure. Um, I, think it's, I think it's great. And Fennel, you said something really important, which is that you have heard from your uh, park and rec director that they don't want to hear from SFBC and they don't want to hear from Walk SF. And that's not to diss them. It's just to recognize uh, we had the same issue with bicycle stuff, right? Sometimes the the best person to be leading this was not the bicycle people, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had a really fantastic bicycle improvement through uh, the downtown of Sacramento, but it was led by business owners along the corridor who wanted traffic slowed down so people could cross the street. It just happened that the way to do that was to install a protected bike lane, right? So the bikes get the got the this terrific facility, but it was led by business owners. So again, knowing who you're, knowing what motivates your decision makers can help you start to line up whose stories are going to be the most useful. So you can, you can say bike stories and pedestrian specific stories are not the stories that are going to be the most compelling. You want to think about the, another way to tell that story mm -hmm. that isn't about people on bikes need more space or something like that. So, so it, the takeaway here is that, you know, your you know, your audience, you're starting to know your audience and that's valuable. Um, to the last kind of set of questions about your methods, uh, you talked a little bit about, um, or we collectively talked a little bit about the need for a plan. So your timeline here is really, you might want to think in very broad strokes. Like if you have a whiteboard, that's a good way to do it. But like if the end result is installation of a continuous route based on a plan that gets approved, mm -hmm. um, what's the step before that? Well, you need people to buy in on the concept, right? So, mm -hmm. so you may be at the conceptual stage here. What you do at the conceptual stage, the story the pilot so far. I'm excited. They are right. Allie can probably knows more of the details and timeline, but it's 
they have like a slow streets pilot version now that they're working on. So that's a great success. So, so, and Fennel, you know what I would do, what you and Allie might want to do? Um, figure out a way to go interview the people who are using this temporary facility and get their feedback. Like, we love this, right? We want this forever, right? Okay. Yeah, that's okay. a. We so, that is what we hear too, because we go to the right now with this pandemic. You know, I mean, this has been our sanctuary, right? So, yeah. and also the kids, I feel like they're the greatest voice of the future. Of future, um, but to have them like maybe do a podcast because it's funny to hear them maybe interview and you know kind of say for so then it's like hey you know because when they start talking to the kids they're like oh um, you know to have those aha moments or some funny stories that were obviously unlikely, um, but um, I feel like maybe that could be part of our initiative because literally we have no school at this point. And if I'm taking my son to the park, then what are we going to do? I'm going to turn him into a, like a little mini activist. And how can I kind of keep him engaged and keep the conversation going with other kids? Have, have, have him interview other kids, right? <laughs> okay. or, or because we're in the time of COVID and, and it's kind of hard to be with other people that are not in our family groups and our safe groups, mm -hmm. empower others in their own family units to create stories. Like okay. kids are just fabulous with the videos and things. Um, talk it out. Right, right. So have, you know, obviously you have to talk to their parents to get all the permissions and everything like that. But they, but if you empowered them to tell their stories and even youth that are a little bit older to, um, you know, to talk about their going surfing or, you know, whatever it is that they're going to be doing with that, with that path. I, th I think the, the takeaway here I see is that um, you've identified a lot of potential stories that would be valuable in moving this idea forward. Um, and I think that's really the, the kind of the big purpose of this pair of workshops is to understand how stories work and to mm -hmm. recognize that there are a lot of different stories that are valuable and that there are a lot of different ways to tell them. Um, it's now, uh, 1230 where I am. So I'm thinking maybe what we'll do, Melissa, is move into this kind of last wrap up piece. I guess before we do that, Fennel, is there any sort of like one last question you have, or is there any feedback for Fennel that we haven't already given? I, the sense of urgency here is kind of confuses me because it's, exciting for this movement with Vision Zero because we're seeing things that have been battled out for so many years now um, get approved and implemented, which of course, as you know, takes you know, not that long, half a day to implement them. But, um, you know, how do you create that sense of urgency when you are looking at like timelines of like, well, maybe in next budget year, we're going to put a line item to evaluate that. How do you counteract that? Any anybody have a suggestion about that, Jenny? What do you think? I was I was laughing because um, creating <laughs> an annoying thing when it comes to anything with politics and like legislation. Um, I think what I have learned, I don't know if it's the right answer, is not you have to mostly not give up and just take every opportunity that we can find to be present in front of it and find a way to share that story again and again. Um, and I mean every opportunity, and that's why we want to grow like our San Francisco family for Bay Area State Streets, because, you know, there's many opportunities that we probably have not taken advantage of. Um, so it's only if it's only heard once or twice or when it is, is on timeline, you know, when we're trying to get a bill passed, um, then it just becomes like this is just an agenda item versus is it relevant and needed. So I think that's one way I have told myself and, you know, why we want to recruit and grow is because, there are probably other opportunities to get the urgency in that way. Because if it's heard multiple times and it's captured multiple times and it's heard in front of different pockets of community or leaders in different facets, then it becomes where, okay, this is not just an isolated thing during this time of the year or, you know, so I think that's one way I have addressed it myself. So I don't get frustrated and give up. Um, but then I think it's also strategically uh, creating urgency by finding new partners. I think that's another area where, you know, with Walk SF and San, San Francisco Family for Safe Street, that's a big focus that I pointed out for the last year and a half is we need to not just recruit more victims to want to be advocates with us, but we have to find more partners. And once again, that nor those normal partners, you know, that might not have anything related to traffic violence, 
or be responsible for it, but our normal people in society, like like this will impact you if we educate you. So those are the two ways well, I would. Yeah, and, and uh, Fennel, you have the sense of urgency in the sense of COVID, right? So the COVID, everything that you've said is your sense of urgency. And also that cities, are, uh, also that Paris is kicking everybody's butt as far as creating all this stuff, right? And Oakland is making, is embarrassing everybody by how fast they're moving. So I think you can, you know, San Francisco wants to be number one in all these things, including green. So in this case, this is about the health of the community and being green and sustainable and being a tourism place when COVID is over and um, getting people to recognize that making that path is going to, it's going to be a, a boon for not just the neighborhood, uh, children who live there, but the businesses uh, of what's possible. I would so, also just I would want to see, please. Very, very briefly, you know, the thing that gets the, the city to move fastest is when people are getting kills. And one thing to look at, because the city keeps track of where all the crashes are, is uh, find out if on that route that this pathway would take, if uh, how many crashes there have been over the last few years, because there are presumably people that are taking that route to get to the park anyway, even though the pathway doesn't yet exist. And if, you know, if um, there have been crashes, yes. um, you know, I remember when San Francisco, when uh, the woman got killed on Howard Street, um, the bike coalition was very effective at getting the city within literally weeks to put in a temporary bike lane along Howard Street, which of course they then didn't complete for the longest time. But uh, nothing gets their attention more than crashes. Amy. Two people have been killed. Two men have been killed in Golden Gate, near Golden Gate Park. Um, one on a bike, hit by a door. This was in the past at least two months, but my sense of time is really off right now. Um, the other one was a motorcyclist, actually, who was going over and was a renowned uh, roller skater. And he was killed, I think, I don't know, Ali could correct me, um, but I believe he was doing like this overpass. I don't remember. Um, and it's unclear, you know, but he died. Amy, you had a thought? I, just a quick thought. And, you know, I'm obviously familiar with the park, but not intimately familiar like those of you who live there. But if, if there's a way also to tap into the urgency, if there's a way to cobble together a route through the park on existing roads and pitch it as a pilot to give people space during the pandemic is often a way to lead to more permanent change. To piggyback on that, I mean, that's what's, that's what's happening in places like uh, Oakland. Los Angeles has closed all of about 40 miles of streets, which is not very much given how big the place is. But they're already talking about making those closures permanent, right? Oakland's talking about making them permanent. So, so remember that the end game of a temporary closure could be a permanent closure. The second thing here, back to the storytelling piece, is that part of the urgency here is the health issue of exposure to COVID. So whereas Fennel, you might be very valuable to speak from the parent's perspective, think about healthcare people or public health people who would also be responsive to this idea. Um, this is something I've been arguing for here in Sacramento that, that a, sa a slow streets campaign is really a public health measure. And it's not about making a nice amenity for uh, people walking and biking, but it's really essential. Uh, it's an essential preventive measure. So figure out who your health voice is, um, you know, who, you know, in your network, who are the healthcare people who would be authorities to be able to speak on that kind of thing? Again, that's a type of story. Amy. Well, also, don't forget to add in mental health with this pandemic. I think that's really important. Absolutely. Yeah. And so that that lends the sense of urgency, right? Because the 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 immediate need is related to the pandemic, and there's no excuse not to take action now, right? Because things are bad, and they're possibly going to get worse. 
there's a, a powerful argument for taking action now. So those are stories that you can start to um, look for right now. Who is the person who can tell the story about the benefits of creating safe, healthy outdoor space for people to get around? Your long game might be connecting lower income residents of the film or with the ocean. The immediate game is to provide a safe space for anybody who's out there. Um, so I we're wanna, really close to time, you guys. I think we really got to we gotta wrap up. I'm going to try to wrap up here. Uh, Melissa, why don't you offer your takeaways and then I have a few last ones. Yeah, okay. So a couple of things I want you guys to remember as you're, you're thinking about these storytelling things is that storytelling is a strategy that's an ongoing process. So once you guys decide to have storytelling uh, front and center as part of your communication strategy, recognize that you can take bite-sized chews of improvement to make measurable improvement. Don't think you have to be brilliant all at once. Um, you can, you know, and so, so many of you are working together. You can support each other in the kinds of specific goals that you want to you want to hit about how to be better storytellers, and then own the power of thinking of yourself as a storyteller. Even if you don't think of yourself as a creative, start thinking of yourself as a storyteller because that's going to start aligning you with looking at great storytellers of all kinds so that you will be looking outside of your realm of advocacy to the authors that inspire you, to the uh, inspirational speakers that inspire you, to the podcasters that inspire you, to the actors that inspire you. You're going to start seeing exactly what they're doing as storytellers. And then they're, they're little things that you can start taking and using, how they're modulating their voices, how they tell things so simply and succinctly, and boom, they always hit that two minute. And like Jim said, when you first start doing these things, you're thinking, there's no way I can boil this story down into two minutes or three minutes or five minutes. Well, you read it out loud to yourself and you're like, I could get rid of half of these words. They're hard to say. I thought they were important when I was writing them down, but now that I'm speaking it, when I'm listening to it, it's hard to take in everything. So really give yourself uh, that. Um, and remember, only stories change hearts and minds. You've got to have the data, but only stories change hearts and minds. The key is they've got to be compelling, right? So the best storytellers are the ones that captivate us. They could be lying. They could not have the right information, but they are charismatic. So know that you've got to have your data, but you do. You've got, you are all doing your homework. Now put your heart and soul into recognizing how in small baby steps you can, as a team and as individuals, move storytelling to create storytelling that really people find riveting. Jim. Yeah, a couple of thoughts um, that kind of dovetail with what uh, Melissa offers. Um, nobody can tell your story as well as you can, but that's also true about other people. You can't tell their stories as well as they can. So this is the argument for kind of uh, growing the pool of storytellers. Um, you may still be in the position to tell someone else's story and that's okay. But this is really an argument for doing so with awareness and respect. Um, and that comes from understanding where they're coming from and, and faithfully telling their story and really attributing their story to them. And um, that, that comes down to, uh, to how you, you know, write the story, rehearse the story and practice it. Um, think broadly about whose stories are most valuable and be bold for look bold about looking for them. Um, you know, if a breadth of voices is part of your mission, start by thinking about whose voices are needed but are not currently being heard. And then start asking around your network, your allies, where to look for those stories and who to talk to. So you may not know the business owners along the uh, a street, but you might be a customer at one of the shops. So go in there and say, who do you know along the street? You know, and, and you want to work your network and really um, work on getting the breadth of your stories. And I, and I think the, the point here is that don't, you're, you're not carrying all of this on your own shoulders. 
um, particularly those of you that are in charge of an organization or a campaign, you don't have to do all this alone because I'll tell you that's a recipe for burnout. Um, uh, you know, and as leaders, you have the rare opportunities to be seen and heard. Um, you're the ones who get typically step up to testify. You're often the ones that get called uh, to be interviewed by the news. That's super valuable real estate. Um, so be be generous about how you share that real estate with other people. That might be even a matter of giving over a speaking or interview opportunity to somebody who normally wouldn't get that opportunity. Um, and that's especially important if you know that their story is especially compelling because they don't normally get heard, right? That's the that's the argument for going through that checklist and thinking about who who doesn't get heard, but who would get who would be a benefit from being heard. Um, you may also only be responsible for telling your own story. We talked about that a little bit over these last two sessions. That's a super important role for you to play. Um, and it's also valuable to be thinking how your story fits into the broader picture. So that's another purpose of today's exercise is to really locate your story within a larger uh, effort. And then finally, and this is really the biggest takeaway for me, is that it's critically important to be strategic about how you go about this. Um, activist movements thrive on the kind of passion that all of you have shared. Every one of you has shared something about your your extreme passion for this subject, you're, you're, you're on a mission. And that's, that's like the beautiful, exciting part of this work. It's really the, fill, the fulfilling part of it for me. Um, and of course, passion alone only gets you so far and running only on passion is an absolute recipe for burnout. <laughs> if, if Gina, you thought you were the only person who could possibly recruit everybody who needs to be involved in this mission, <laughs> You're going you're gonna to start to feel stressed out over that. So, so that's the argument for being organized. You know, you're all, we, especially those of you who are involved with the Bay Area uh, Families for Safe Streets program, you're all part of a collective network of people doing good work. Um, you're competing for attention with really well-organized institutions and businesses, right? Um, organizations that, that capture a lot more bandwidth. Your passion may be the secret key that they don't have, right? Like you, you may be able to bring a fire and a personal experience that an institution or a business can't bring to the table. Um, and that's why you need to be so strategic about using it. So um, uh, with that, I really thank you for all of your effort. Um, I am, I um have been out of the active, uh, an active role in an advocacy organization for the last couple of years. And it, it feels great to hear you guys, to be in the room with you guys and to hear your passion. Um, this is where I want to be. It's lovely to hear about this. And, and I really uh, respect and encourage your efforts um, in learning how to incorporate storytelling into what you're doing. Um, Melissa, final thoughts? No, I just want to say thank you. I'm sorry we went so far over on time. Um, we will follow up with all of you in the next day or so with a sh very short survey that we would love to have you fill out so that we can keep making these uh, better and as valuable for you as we can. And we will also send you an email with highlighting some of the things that we talked about today that we hadn't shared before so that you can keep them front and center as you move forward. And Hold on to that uh, tip sheet that uh, and the, the homework was on that that Jim created uh, and feel free to print that out and use that as a way to get your yourself or your teams um, moving uh, forward strategically with your storytelling um, as you go forward and, be, and beyond into different projects. So thank you all and have a great rest of your day. And we will okay. hopefully hear from you all soon. Thank you so much. Thanks. 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 Than